We all have those cases. The cases that penetrate something deeper. I can't explain it. In 99% of the cases I cover, I can study them. Look at them from an observant point of view. They don't give me nightmares, they don't affect me and simmer in my mind. But this one, this one does. I have two cases that sits close to my heart. The first one is the Golden State Killer, East Area Rapist, Original Night Stalker, Joseph James D'Angelo. I couldn't get enough of that case back when it was still unsolved. It just tickled something. The other one is the murder of Lisa Holm. I know why this case gets to me. I just don't understand why it happened with this particular case. But I need to get it off my mind. That's what I did with the Golden State Killer documentary. A deep dive of all the things that tickled me, freed me of that case in a way. I need to do the same with this one, only it's more of an emotional and unconscious connection rather than one of fascination and curiosity. It's the fact that in other cases I can look at the events from every angle, from every point of view. I can look at it from the killer's point of view, I can see it through the victim's point of view, and I can also look at it from those around and the objective point of view. That doesn't work with Lisa Holm. Let's try and change that today as we cover the horrific murder of 17 year old Lisa Holm. To you it's probably just another case. I have covered many similar for about a year and a half now. It's not necessarily more brutal or more tragic than other cases, but it is still brutal. It is still horrible. Lisa Holm never saw it coming. She couldn't have known the depravity this man saw in his head when he looked at her. She was working a summer job at a cafe outside the village of Shelby in western Sweden. She was 17. She had her eyes set on the future. She had been working at the cafe for a few weekends. Her mom always drove her there and back home, but now she was going to make the trips on her own. She had a moped now, so on June 7th, 2015, she drove it to her summer job, the cafe. The cafe itself sits close to some barns, surrounded by meadows and trees, all blooming green at that time of year. The hours went by, and so they had closed down the cafe for the day. It was about 6 p.m. Before Lisa's colleagues left the area in a car and Lisa was left alone to make her own way home on her moped, Lisa's dad got a phone call. It was a pocket ring. I don't know if that is an actual word in English. It's something that we in Sweden call fikringning, so I just directly translated that word. It basically means she unknowingly called her dad up. He could hear some metallic noises, and he could hear Lisa talking to someone. This phone call was probably made when Lisa's friends was still there, so it was probably that conversation he heard. Probably. Four minutes before the call, Lisa had texted her dad saying she was about to start her 50-minute drive home. But about 1 hour and 40 minutes had gone by since the text of the pocket call, so back at the home Lisa's parents were getting worried. This wasn't like her, what if she had gotten into an accident on the road? 
Lisa's father drove out towards the cafe, keeping a watchful eye on the roads and lands by the side of the roads, to see if his little girl maybe had some issues with her moped, maybe she was stranded somewhere. But for all his efforts, for all his wishes, she wasn't anywhere to be seen. Then he arrived at the cafe. Maybe he could find answers there. It was perplexing and horrifying to think of at the same time. Stood there in the parking lot was Lisa's moped. The keys still in the ignition, a bag of her possessions lay there as well. What the fuck? She hadn't even left the cafe. Where was she? What could have happened to his 17 year old daughter? She had just been about to leave. Where could she be? She was out there somewhere. What if someone had taken her? Someone had to have taken her, right? Why would she just wander off on her own? But if someone had taken her... The thoughts were too dark. The hopes quickly joining them in that darkness. Was she even still alive? That same night, Lisa's parents and their friends began searching immediately. Her parents had of course contacted police as well, and in the days that followed, the search efforts expanded greatly. By June 10, three days after her disappearance, about 60 police officers utilizing both horses and dogs had participated along with hundreds of volunteers organized by the organization Missing People. Everyone wanted to find her, everyone wanted answers. During these days, belongings of Lisa Holm was found scattered about the meadows in view of the cafe. The police had also tapered off a barn close by. They had been finding things along the way, and as time passed, the hope of finding her alive passed as well. The day after her disappearance, we're now back at June 8 again, police had publicated her disappearance as a kidnapping. They had found her gloves in the barn, they would taper off. They also found her phone and her phone case scattered about. Her phone appeared to have been broken by someone. On June 9, police pleaded to the public for information as they posted Lisa Holmes' photo in the media. And by June 10, hundreds of people were out looking for her. There was a stranger among them though. A man, a foreigner from Lithuania, participating in the searching. He was acting kinda strange. He was trying to stop searchers from looking in certain areas, and he was trying to direct them towards other areas. Because he knew, he knew exactly where Lisa Holm was. He knew exactly where she had been all along, because he was the man that had killed her. I don't know what he thought he would accomplish. It was just stupid of him. He put himself in a position of suspicion, and so on June 12, Five days after her disappearance, when police broke into a decaying worker's hut and found the decomposing body of Lisa Holm stuffed into the locker, this suspicious Lithuanian man quickly became suspect number one. They could now confirm that a murder had been committed, and with that, they got investigative tools at their disposal that they didn't have before, because this was now a murder investigation. The locker that Lisa Holmes' body had been stuffed into was small. It was tall, but the opening, the wideness of it was very small. So to stuff her corpse into that locker, he had to bend and break her limbs into unnatural positions. So what exactly had happened that afternoon? What went down on June 7th, 2015, in the farmlands of western Sweden, the night Lisa Holmes, 17 years old, left us? His name was Nerius Belivisius. He was 35 years old. He was living in Sweden with a friend of his and with his wife. He worked in the bar adjacent to the cafe. He was a bit of a weirdo. He clearly had some sexual perversions confirmed in the pornography confiscated on his computer. Some of it is uh, regular hardcore stuff and some of it is just beyond. I know because in the court documents for this case, photographs and thumbnails of porn he had been watching was on full display for everyone to see. 
But of course, the porn itself isn't to blame. For example, Ted Bundy was well aware of that when he said it. He just wanted to leave one last fuck you before he left. Another thing about Daryl Ted while we're on the subject, if you watch that interview, you can see him relive his crimes. You can see the orgasmic enjoyment he takes in simply the thoughts. I can guarantee that if you flip that table at that moment to the side, you would see dear old Ted with a massive heart on in his pants. I wonder if Nerius feels the same way. He had a clear preference. He liked to watch them choke. Their powerlessness and as a result the power that gave him turned him on beyond anything else. The attack was impulsive in the sense that his arousal may have been impulsive. But it wasn't coming out of the blue. He didn't just flick a switch and attack. He was on the prowl. The day before Lisa Holm fell victim to the Lithuanian man, another woman out jogging had been stopped by the same Lithuanian man. He had asked her for directions. She was happy to help, but then he asked if she would come over to his car. Pointed out on a map he had there, the woman felt a strong sense of uncomfort. Something was off, and so she ignored the man's request and continued her jog home. The man did not follow, but after the murder of Lisa Holm, she would point out Nerius as that man. He clearly had reached a boiling point in his life. A point where the porn could no longer satisfy his twisted fantasies. He had to act them out, and he did. I'm not sure exactly how he lured her in. He proclaims his innocence to this day, but he probably tried to lure her into the barn. The barn that sat opposite the cafe. Once he had her there, he overpowered her easily. He bound her hands and her feet and placed tape over her mouth. Then he took some rope he had with him. He tied it tightly around her throat and tossed it over a beam. He strained the rope from the opposite side. He tied it in place. He was hanging her. Not the quick hanging where you fall and are supposed to break your neck. It was slow and deliberately so. He watched her struggle. He watched her eyes turn red. He watched her face turn blue as she did everything she could to escape her fate. And this is what turned him on. He stood there and watched her struggle and as she did he began masturbating. He may have even masturbated multiple times because this was his dream scenario. He was finally living out his dream, but his dream was someone else's nightmare. He wasn't very careful. Once he was done with Lisa Holm, once she stopped struggling and stopped breathing for good, he took her down, brought her to that locker in that decaying hut and crammed her in there, threw a pile of dirty clothing on top of her, close behind him and left to be with his wife. It's unknown whether his friend or wife knew about his activities, but one thing is for sure, he and one of those two arrived at the farm where the hut was located on June 12, before the body had been found. They tried to tell the people looking that they had already searched that area, but soon they found Lisa Holmes' jacket and her helmet nearby. Nerius was fucked. He had left DNA all over the place, and even though he tried to say his DNA was because he had worked there where she was hung, it didn't explain the DNA he had left on her clothes. The traces of semen found in the so-called milk room where the crime had been committed, and it wasn't in just one place his semen was found. He tried to say that blood had come there because he had cut his fingers while working. That the semen was because he just liked to jerk off in the milk room during working hours. But his DNA was found on the inside of Lisa Holmes' jeans. Add to that the fact that he tried to divert the searchers and he had tried to lure another woman into his car. It's obvious. He is the killer. Usually in Sweden, you get caught, it's not that bad. We've released serial killers and serial rapists in the past. Even high exposure offenders committed for several brutally violent rapes can get released after 8 years inside. This was not how it went for Nerigius. 
it was really tough for him on the inside. He was constantly getting abused, beaten and threatened by other inmates. He felt that his life was in danger, so he requested to be sent to Lithuania where maybe he could shorten his prison sentence. Being committed to a life sentence in Sweden isn't really a life sentence. It can be, but it can also mean 25 years or something inside. The Regius wanted to beat that. Even 25 years would be too long, and it could have been for life if he wasn't deemed fit for release. In Lithuania, he could shorten his sentence, and he could escape the daily beatings he took from his fellow inmates in the Swedish prison, so in 2016 he was transferred to Lithuania. In 2017, he appealed his life sentence and got it shortened. He was to spend 15 years behind bars. But that sentence was then appealed by a judge or something, and his original sentence of life in prison was restored. He tried to play the system, but instead he got fucked by it. The system clapped Nerius sore cheeks. In March of 2019, the Lithuanian government did make a change in their system. Prisoners sentenced to life can apply for parole after a minimum of 25 years. I doubt that they will release Norigius after 25, and he still got clapped by the system, because despite his attempts to shorten his stay, he must stay. And I imagine it's harder to get parole in Lithuania than it would be in Sweden. However, if he one day is released, he will be an old man. This was a hard video to make. I know it's been a very long time since I uploaded the teaser and the delays has been because of many reasons. It's not an excuse of course, I should have made this video sooner, but it's hard sometimes cause it's, well it's not like I make money doing this, one day maybe but I'll need at least a 5 figure amount of subscribers before I can commit to that. And I do love doing this, I really do, it provides an outlet for me. It allows me to say and talk about things I don't get to express all that often. I just want to assure you, because I know some content creators grow tired of creating. They take hiatuses that last months, maybe even years, because they're sick of it. That's not me. I still love this, I'm not tired of it, because I know I have things to say still, cases to cover, specials still planned, still on my mind. There have just been things going on in my personal life. I want to say a few more words about the case before the video ends. I told you earlier this case is tough for me. I remember following the search live in 2015. I was 20 years old when this happened. Maybe I felt a connection to the case. I can still remember the extremely huge media coverage at that time. Lisa would have been 22 years old this year. She would have been a woman, probably not a household name. Just another person living life. But instead she is a household name. Not for her achievements, but for her demise. This is the first time I've said Nerigius' name out loud. This case had that effect. Where if you look at Ted Bundy for example. It's all Ted. It's hard to remember the names of his victims. But with Lisa Holm it's the opposite. It's harder to remember the name of the killer. I like that. It's not a very long episode, but I hope it packs a punch. And don't worry, there is more coming. Next up is a double feature, and one of the cases is actually something that happened locally to where I live. Now, saying I'm back would indicate I was ever gone, but you know, it feels good to be back. <laughs>